Chapter 5, Exit Strategy. I used to have an issue with heights. So I did what I always do when faced with a challenge. I beat it. We were on vacation years ago in what must have been the rich me world because work that we could never afford where I used to come from. So on this vacation, there was a zip line between the two hotel towers. It was the absolute last, most horrifying thing I could ever imagine doing. So I signed up for it and, as they say, broke my foot off in fear's ass. I screamed like a little kid the entire way across, convinced every second of the way that I was going to die. And since the most god-awful thing I could think of doing was to look down, I made myself look down. The stupid part of my brain could not believe the thinking part, which said that the cable and harness were time-tested and relatively safe, in spite of the liability release my father had assigned. That stupid part of our brains used to be the most valuable thing we had. It kept our paleo-whatever ancestors from getting eaten by saber-toothed tigers and putting their hands in fire. Now, it mostly just messes with us and gets us into trouble on a regular basis because it's so damn stupid. Well, before school started on Monday, my idiot brain kicked in and kept trying to convince me that I was going to die. That the universe was done with me, and it wouldn't even wait until Friday's game. Long before then, it would use my own school to kill me by splitting my head with a falling air vent, or choking me with a cafeteria hot dog, or blowing me up in a science experiment gone terribly wrong. I was totally irrationally bracing for the worst, just like Leo had talked about in his basement that other day. But I did what I had to do. I pretended like I wasn't screaming on the inside and went to school, like it was an ordinary Monday. And you know what? It was an ordinary Monday. It was almost disappointing how ordinary it was. I gave a weak excuse for a late English paper. I got a B on a math quiz thanks to being tutored. And I ate lunch with the usual crowd and did not choke. If I didn't know any better, I think everything was fine. And that night, I did what I do every Monday night in this world. Hint, it wasn't watching Monday night football. It was dealing drugs. I was a drug dealer. Even now, saying those words, it just doesn't sound real, like a line from someone else's miserable life. Because, because of Monday Night Football, it was the only night I knew my dad wouldn't turn up at the store unexpected. Because when I wasn't selling at parties in school hallways, I had my customers come to me, in our supplement store, once 7 o'clock rolled around, and I was the only employee on duty. My first customer was a kid my age, but not from my school, who came at seven on the dot. Hey, Ash, he said, handing me a big wad of bills, mostly singles. The usual. Count it if you like. Sure thing, Alex. I hadn't known his face until I saw him. I didn't know his name until I spoke it. And I didn't know what his usual was until muscle memory made me reach beneath the counter and pull out a bottle of vitamin C, which I suddenly remembered contained a baggie with a gram of coke. I don't have to count it, I told him. I trust you. Thanks, man. I pocketed the cash, the little bell above the door jingled as he left, and I felt a whole new level of disgust for what I had just done, at furious odds with the part of me that saw this as business as usual. The rest of the evening was a mix of normal customers and special customers. And it wasn't like you could pick these people out at a lineup. It was one lawyer-looking guy who asked for two bottles of my special vitamin C, which was a top seller, apparently. A woman my mother's age in a tennis outfit who had her kids wait in the car while she bought our proprietary blend of echinacea. Echinacea equals ecstasy. And there was an old lady who was sweet but slow and very tired, who asked how my family was, then requested a bottle of our best ornithine, Ornithine equals oxycodone. There were some customers my alt me knew better than others, but no one was new to this ball game. I found that the only way to deal with this was to fold in upon myself, becoming an observer in my own flesh. I knew what I had to do without even having to think, so I did my best to shut down all my higher brain functions. I told myself I was just a passenger on a screwed up ride. The ride would end, but where would it leave me? 
What was my next destination? The stop signs were all still blue, which meant the worlds didn't cancel each other out. Instead, they built on one another. It probably meant that the next world, my family would still be rich and I'd still be selling drugs. Maybe, I thought, this might be the end of it. I'd be stuck here in this reality and would have to figure out how to make the best of it. If I could wash away the sleazy part of this life and stop dealing, I'd be okay. The thing is, sleaziness is like an oil stain on your driveway. No matter how many times you wash it, it just keeps seeping back up through the concrete.